I'm Kenton Claremont, and you're listening to the Train to Hunt podcast. Dude, there he is. He's coming in. Come in. Get ready. All right. So we're off and running. Um, so uh, you guys are in Missoula right now? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, what are you guys doing in Missoula? We currently call Missoula, Montana our home base. We oh, okay. travel for work. Um, we used to live here full time, but we moved um, as far as for traveling work in um, 2017, early 2017. Yeah. And we've been traveling all over ever since, but we always come back to Missoula and we have a, an address here and it's our home base. See, so you guys work together? We don't work together, um, but we are both in the medical profession. I'm an endocrinologist, which is a physician that specializes in hormones. And gotcha. Coulter is a physical therapist, so um, we both work in the healthcare field. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, 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 okay. Okay. And, endocrinologist is a uh, – it's people who, like, work uh, – like you said, work with hormones, like uh, people who have thyroid issues and – any kind of hormone issues that's who they go see is the endocrinologist right you got it yeah right on so and and how is that how is that a traveling good so there are there's a really high need for endocrinologists um in in the united states and also actually worldwide and there's also a pretty high need for physical therapists in certain areas of the country yeah so because of that um we get to travel and, and go to places that are in really high need and fill in temporarily um, where they don't yet have a permanent endocrinologist. Um, and that allows us to see a lot of different places and also to have a lot of flexibility in our schedule for things like hunting season. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so let's re- rewind the clock all the way back. So you guys – um um, our, our listeners are really curious as to like, you guys are two times national champions. Like, the people want to know like, who you are, like, where do you come from? Like, were you just born like, be a beast or like, were you country kids? Were you city kids? Like, what, what kind of deal was, I, um, doesn't matter. Let's say, uh, but let's have Katie go first. Just give us a, a just a, a peek behind the curtain. Like, what, what the, where were you born? How were you kind of raised? And then how did you kind of come? to, uh, you know, shooting a bow? I was born in Poto, Oklahoma, and both my parents are from Texas, but we were living on the Arkansas-Oklahoma border around the time I was born. But my my parents moved my family up to Jackson, Wyoming, uh, when I was going into the fifth grade, which is actually where I met Coulter in my fifth grade class. Oh, um, whoa. Yeah. And... My dad worked as an outfitter in Jackson, Wyoming, so he was a fishing guide, hunting guide, and, and pack trip guide. So in the summers, um, I spent a lot of time with my dad up in the mountains, um, but I didn't start hunting until Colter and I started dating, um, which was our senior year of high school. And I didn't start bow hunting um, until last season, so this fall will be my, my second bow hunting season. Okay. Okay, and uh, so how long have you been shooting a bow, did you say? I've been shooting a bow for about two and a half years now. So last year when you guys won the national championship, you had been shooting a bow for about a year and a half? Um, about I thought it been a bit that long. Yeah, maybe a year. <laughs> so, hey, listeners, you hear that? Like, you don't have to be, have been shooting a bow since you were, like, out of the womb. Like you can pick up a bow and get pretty good at it pretty quickly, like Katie. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to be able to shoot like her as quickly as she is, but that's pretty incredible. That's that's pretty incredible. So um, you, this is your second year of hunting. And uh, um, so did, where did you go to college? Did you guys go to college together? Unfortunately, you know, we were late enough into high school you know, our senior year that we were already committed to our college decisions. And Before you professed your love to each other, you were, like, already commit, <laughs> committed well, to your... that in sixth grade. But <laughs> it, it doesn't stick real well in the sixth grade, does it, Holter? I got it, yeah. 
Yeah. Katie yeah. <laughs> broke, broke your uh, 12-year-old heart, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well at, least you, you can't, at least you were persistent. That's wrestlers for you. They're just going to keep coming at you until you just basically give up. That's right. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, so Coulter, uh, look, give us a little bit. Where are you born, raised? You, so obviously you guys met in the fifth grade, so out out in that area. Yeah, I was born and raised in Jackson, Wyoming. Okay. Uh, my folks are still there. My sister's there. So we go back often. Katie's mom's still there. Um, and yeah, that was home. So my grandpa. Years ago, came out from Pennsylvania, building tents and guiding hunt, and he would go back to Pennsylvania, and every time he went back, he said he couldn't think of doing anything else but coming out west. And yeah. so he decided to do that and then um, raise his family out there. And I always told him I was thankful um, that he made that decision because we knew kind of how lucky we were to grow up there, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, I go back to the mountains in a second. Um, so that's got home for us growing up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you went out. You went all the way out to Idaho for college. Yep. I went. Katie went to Fort Col- or she actually went to Virginia for a year um, to James Madison University. Okay. And then she came out to uh, Fort Collins at Colorado State and finished her last three years of college there. And I was in Boise at Boise State. So. Yeah. Doing some wrestling, right? Yeah. I had a short short go at it due to a back injury and a few things. But I did, you know, I got some some things that were seemed to be left unfinished for me there. But wrestling's rough. It's a rough sport, man. You're, I mean, fact is, you're going to get hurt. It's kind of like bull riding. Like if you call, if you wrestle in college, you're going to get hurt. It's just a matter yeah. of how bad, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, you, uh, I heard that. You no, know, I heard uh, not from you, but I heard that. Like you, you were there when uh, when Adam Hall was there, right? Adam came on just as I was leaving, essentially. Okay. So it's kind of just kind of passed to you guys kind of passed in the in the threshold of the of the wrestling wrestling room, huh? Yep. And a lot of I mean we had a lot of good guys around that time. Um uh, Ben Charrington was roommate of mine and he went on to win the national title at um one fifty seven. I think that was in two thousand that two thousand and six. Yeah, seems like seems like it was. Uh, yeah, they don't even have wrestling anymore, do they, Coulter? Ah, uh, don't bring up such a sore spot. I know, man. Hey, I know I'm sticking. I'm like sticking my finger in the knife. And I know it. <laughs> but that is complete, like, an utter nonsense. We don't want to get down this rabbit hole too far. But like, yeah, it's, that's, yeah. Hopefully, we'll get it back. You know, wrestling yeah. things kind of like a train on that boat hunting community, pretty tight knit group. It is. It is. And you start. Messing with it too much, that's going to be the wrong decision. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Once they get some administrative changes coming down the down the line, things will get back in order. So, yeah, yeah. Great place to kind of go to school for sure. Yeah. So, and uh, so, Katie, you went to uh, you went to C- uh, CSU, Colorado State. Yes, yeah, I graduated yeah. there. So you you guys both kind of had. So okay, you're in Colorado. You're at Colorado State. Coulter is out there at Boise State, and and you guys are living college lives. I mean, because I mean, you guys are both in the medicine in the medical field. That does that means you were in college longer than three years. Um, how how did that? How did the, you guys end up making that work? Just a lot of airplane tickets. Yeah, we we were long distance all through college and. Um, we were studying hard, really working hard, and we saw each other whenever we could. Obviously, we spent our summers together um, and then holidays, but we got through that four years, and we ended up getting married just two weeks after we graduated from college, and then we went straight to Arizona for me to start medical school that fall. Gotcha. So you both, so then you both went to Arizona and started, um, and he started working, you started medical school, or both of you started school again? 
Yeah, I didn't know right away I wanted to do physical therapy. It took me a little bit, a couple of years to figure it out. Okay. Um, and so we both went to Arizona for her medical school, and then we were there for a couple of years. And then we ended up coming to Denver for her last year of medical school, and then I started PT school there. And we were in Denver for six years where I finished school and got some work years under my belt, and then Katie finished her residency and fellowship uh, yep. in Denver. And then nice. after that, we made the move to Montana. Nice. Nice. And then it brings us to how did you hear about uh, the train? How about how did you hear about train to hunt and the whole train to hunt challenge thing? The last year or two we were in Denver, it had come across my radar. I'm not sure exactly how, um, but I didn't, it didn't work out for me as far as timing those couple of years to get to an event, but it was something that as soon as I heard about it, I, I said, you know, essentially my competitive career with sports was done yeah. and that was the next kind of step. So I had just gotcha. started shooting a bow actually when we were in Colorado. I grew up just rifle hunting mm -hmm. and in Colorado, the rifle hunts are pretty short and in order to get some more time in the woods, picking up a bow is a great way to do that. So that's kind of what really pushed me into that. Plus I was just looking for another bit of an edge on the challenge of getting closer to animals and just making it a little bit more difficult on myself yeah. to harvest some, some meat. So I've told people all along that train to hunt really truly does what it says. It trains you to hunt. And when I really was getting serious in archery, looking at the train to hunt series, um, it is the, the best way, I think, to push you to really learn how to shoot and be an athlete at the same time. And so after I had done one train to hunt event and Katie was contemplating getting a bow and starting to shoot, it just was like a launching pad for both of us to really up our archery game. And for her, knowing that last year was going to be her first year, last season was her first archery hunting season, um, I said, man, if you do this train to hunt series, it's going to, it's going to bump you essentially two, three, maybe five or six years into that experience level. Whereas if you don't push yourself like that, it takes years to develop some of those habits that training for a season like that kind of forces you to hone some of those skills a lot faster. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Katie, what's it? Uh, what do, you, what do you say about all that? Are you, do you, first of all, do you you got do you have any kind of athletic background? You're so athletic and fit, and like you you must have some sort of uh, athletic background. Oh yeah, I, I grew up playing sports. My dad had me in sports since I was five years old. My my favorites and the ones that I um, excelled at in high school was downhill ski racing and soccer. Um, oh yeah. I wanted to play. Uh, soccer in college, but I, my studies were just too overwhelming. It was it was uh, not in the cards for me to be able to do both and go to medical school. Um, and I very much uh, think that the people who are able to play Division One sports and, and study for graduate school is like a whole new level. Of, I very much respect those people. Um, but, yeah, because Division yeah. Division One sports is a job. It's a job yeah. in itself. Like it's a full time gig, and if you are serious, I I feel like I feel the same way about uh, that you just said. Is anybody who's with that is has the um, the bandwidth, I guess we'll call it, to become a serious Division One athlete and a Division One um, student of you know of anything, especially medical um, student. Um, they they just have something that I don't. It's just kind of like you know Olympic athletes. They have something physically that I just don't have. I, I you know that's a whole other beast. If somebody that can be a Division One athlete and a medical student at the same time. Um, I I respect those people who are able to do that so much. It's just incredible. I I decided that I needed to to focus on studying. So that's what I did. Yeah. But but yeah, I've played sports my whole life and um, staying active and 
and staying competitive, um, I don't know about what is is very high priority for me. And what do you think? Uh, what do you think as far as like if, you know, Coulter just touched on something pretty big. Like you just you um, he basically explained to you that this is going to really um, lessen the learning curve if you do these these challenge competitions. Were you kind of reluctant at first? Were you like, I don't know about this? Or did you just say, you know what, let's do it. Let's just jump in and, and give it a shot. And, and do you agree that, that it that it actually, like, helps speed up the process and make you a better sh- a shooter and better hunter quickly, quicker? Yeah, he hands down, Coulter was absolutely right about that. I credit Train to Hunt um, with launching me into my the best first season I could have had as a novice bow hunter, absolutely hands down. Um, Train to Hunt puts you in situations that that mimic as as best you can mimic, I think, a real life hunting situation. And we we hunted really hard last fall. We uh we were so physical in those mountains and just running after elk and um carrying your bow around all day in the hot sun and, and train to hunt is by far the, the best uh, thing I could have done to prepare myself for that. That's 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 good to hear. All right, so now I think that's you know obviously I <laughs> That's what, that's the whole point of it. Like when it is, it's conception was, uh, what is the whole idea behind the train to hunt events? And it, and you know, it's always been the same. And it's a, a, as accurate of major and stick as I can come up with for somebody who is preparing for a bow hunting season. Um, that's, that's it. I could try and get them in as many situations as I can think or dream up and, um, physically just give them a test that because some people, and this is the truth, you guys, a lot of people think, like, my fitness program is awesome, and I'm in the best shape, and it's probably true, I'm in the best shape of my life. Like, I don't know if I, if I, you know, I'm ready for sure. And then they go out in the mountains, and they find out, holy cow, like, I am not in shape. I did that when I was a, so I played college baseball, and I was an athlete. I mean, I mean, I know that's kind of questionable whether baseball players are real athletes or not, but... <laughs> Uh, but I was I was working out a lot. Does that count? So I was I was working out a lot, and so I but then I hit the mountains in the fall, and I was just like, man, I'm a turd. Like I I couldn't keep up with anybody. You know what I mean? So, um, so I think that what train to hunt the train to hunt challenge offers is somebody an arena to really get an accurate measuring measurement on how is my training program. Um, um, how effective is it towards getting me ready for a uh, backcountry hunting season? And so to hear you say that, Katie, is exactly what, um, exactly what we've always strived for. And um, it's, it's awesome to hear that that's exactly what it did. So, um, yeah. we think that yeah. you're, you're doing a great job. Um, and you keep pushing, pushing the, you know, the limits. Um, yeah. We, this is our second year at Nationals, and um, the kind of challenges that you kind of mixed in there for some surprises and some some extra grit. Um, you're you're really you really are preparing people for for actual true hunting and the way that we like to do it. You know, there's there's yeah. a lot. It's all relative to how you want to do it, but you are targeting this this niche of people that want to be very physical in their hunts. Um, we want to feel like we have pushed ourselves to the very limits to, to harvest our own meat. Yeah, and ab- absolutely. And it's, it's one of the, the, the philosophies, like I got two kind of two big like things that I hope people, somebody, I'm sure you're going to disagree with me, but my philosophy is this, is if you physically prepare for a, a really hard backcountry hunt, like lots of elevation, lots of weight, lots of distance, lots of, you know, just a physically, physically a tough hunt, you can do any hunt that requires you to move less, like a tree stand hunt or a blind hunt or a, a hunt that is more of a, a spot and stock style of hunting, um, where it doesn't work the other way. Like you can't, like you can't prepare physically, like for, okay, for like a myth, like a, a tr- I'm going to sit in a tree stand every day for, you know, for two weeks and like physically that physically that's just more, you know, it's just 
kind of trying to, um, you know, avoid the boredom and tiredness and don't fall out of the tree and fall asleep. It doesn't work the other way. You know, it's kind of like, in my opinion, and this is probably my humble opinion, a country boy, somebody who has, that's raised in a country with country skills, they can build a fire, skin a butt, you know, they can filter water, these kind of things, can survive in the city. Like, if you just drop them in the city, they can survive. But it doesn't work the other way. You can't take somebody who's never experienced the country and drop them in a, you know, just they grew up in the city, doesn't really know anything about the country or anything like that, and drop them in the, in the country. And, like, they, they may die. Honestly, like they might physically die. So um, I feel like if you're going to be doing any kind of hunting, you might as well train hard. You know, train for the train for a hunt that's going to be for, that's going to be way maybe more physically demanding than you would expect that your hunt's going to be, and then you then you're probably going to be rubbing up against pretty close to ready for what you've got going. So, um, and yeah, like you mentioned, training to hunt is just a major aspect for that. So, um, so all right, my next question is going to be is this, and uh, it might be a hard one, but I I I, I bet you guys will will agree because you guys are both such studs and like uh, uh, you seem to be like so evenly matched um when you do you guys have an opinion like who's getting a better deal like <laughs> like does Coulter is Coulter getting a really good deal for having you as his as his or are you getting a really good deal for having Coulter as yours that's an easy one <laughs> yeah I'm definitely getting the, the better end of the deal uh, okay all right well it's, she's tougher than I am and um, well, heck, she's very close in the shooting department at this point as well. So yeah, so you so uh, you're you're getting the deal. Yeah, and I knew that going into this. Like yeah. I did, um, the men's team competition, the first qualifier. I don't know, three years ago or something that yeah. I did, which was great. You know, we did, we had fun and we did did well. But I knew once Katie was going to maybe jump on board that. This was that we had the potential to really push and make a run for it because um, you know she doesn't like to do anything kind of halfway. It's, it's going to yeah. be if we're going to compete, we're going to we're going to get ready and we're going to do it. So, so what you're saying is Katie's tougher than the guy who you teamed up with the first time. <laughs> yeah, and we're actually staying at his house in his front yard. <laughs> We'll make sure he listens in. Hey, hey, you know what? I, it's tough. It's tough to not agree with that. Like, I, it's, I, and the fact of the matter is, and I know, you know, I apologize in advance to women everywhere, is that when you talk about co-ed anything, co-ed softball, co-ed volleyball, co-ed training to hunt challenge, it really, it really comes down to how tough are is the girls on on that team. That's it, because like. Guys are easy to come by, like whatever. Like they're going to be tough or they're not. And but like, but the girls are going to make the team. Like that's that's the way it goes. And um, that's I mean, you can't have a turd for a guy. I mean, I, I, we, I've seen that before, where like the girl had to go back to the dude, and like an hour later he kind of crawled across the uh, finish line. But in the same respect, like you gotta you gotta have you gotta have a tough. A tough lady next to you, you know, and, and Colter, I agree. You're lucky to have that. that, that <laughs> I agree that. Right. I agree that, that to have that toughness next to you, man. That, 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 awesome. Yeah, and it's together. and it's and it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch because you guys are, you guys seemingly just kind of know each other's moves. It makes sense that you know each other since the fifth grade because you just kind of seemingly know each other's moves and. And, uh, you know, your communication is, is a lot of just physical communication as opposed to, like, having to, like, encourage each other a lot, just kind of go and, and, and just doing work and getting the, the task done, accomplishing mission. And um, the way you guys go about doing your business is is, is, is awesome and uh, fun to watch. So Yeah, I think, you know, it, it trickles right over into the hunting season, which is the coolest part because, like I said before, it's training us to hunt and – we're working together, and now when we're shooting together and training together, when we see a, a bull or a herd that, you know, we're going to go after, we it's just like doing the event. I mean, we just – we hitch down the straps, and we start moving. And I know about her pace. She knows mine. And when I'm tired, I know she's probably tired. And, 
when we get into position, it's, it's just the same as far as knowing your, your arrows, knowing the wind, knowing what shots yeah. we can and can't make, what shots we don't want to take. Because we've been doing it essentially since February, March, April, May, you know, it just. Yeah. So, yeah. And you get, you know, only one or two, maybe a handful of opportunities in a season. You know how big of, big of a deal it is to, to make oh, yeah. crunch time. We yeah. feel like that gives us the best shot at making it count. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I, I couldn't agree more. So, okay, you guys, tell me this. What would you guys, because there's a lot of talk. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people don't do the train on challenge. You've heard me say several of them. One of them is just not willing to let go of the ego and, oh, man, I don't want to, like, go out and do it and have, you know, people lose all doubt that I'm not the person that I, I appear to be on Instagram and Facebook. Um, or, man, it's just too hard and I don't want to get hurt. Or, um, you know, on and on. There's lots of excuses not to do it. Um, what would you say to somebody? One of the excuses, excuses is just that it's just too hard. Like, I'm not, it's too, it's too much, it's too hard. I don't think that I'd be able to do it. Now we're talking about qualifiers here, not nationals. What would you, what would you guys say to somebody who's out there, been on the fence for maybe a couple years and been maybe watching, but is still afraid, like, man, I, I just don't know if, if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a fool out of myself. It might be just too hard for me. What would you say to somebody like that? Well, I actually had a conversation with, um, the wife of one of the male competitors at nationals who was coming to to watch and support him um and i asked her if she was a bow hunter if she had a bow and she said yes and i was like why aren't you out here and she said you know i was i'm a really shy person and i was just intimidated by basically just competing um in front of other competitors and and other people who are watching um and and she said that now that I've been here and I've witnessed um, what's going on, I've seen that the the athletes in the crowd are very, very supportive. Um, and it's kind of, um, you know, no bullshit kind of environment. So she said that she, after watching and observing, she felt confident enough that, you know, she wasn't going to get made fun of if she made a mistake or, or, or whatever it was that she was afraid of. So I, I, would, I would try to tell people that um, – the environment is actually extremely supportive. Um, we're all out there helping each other out, encouraging each other as much as we can, watching other competitors as much as we can. Um, and it's, it's an environment that is uplifting, um, nothing mm -hmm. other than uplifting. Um, and the, the other thing that I would say is, is asking yourself, what would you do if you weren't afraid that a lot of fear – hold people back in, in many, many different ways. So if I'm feeling like I'm not wanting to do something, um, if I ask myself, what would you do if you weren't afraid, oftentimes my answer is, well, I would go ahead and do it. Um, mm -hmm. just ask themselves that more often, and and uh, that might just be a way to kind of push through some of that fear. That, that's, that's such a huge, very simple, yet very, um, very huge um, approach and very logical approach. Like, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? Mm -hmm. um, if you would get, oh, I'd just go ahead and do it. Well, <laughs> go ahead and do it then, because fear's a liar, right? Like, just fear's <laughs> just lying to you. So that's, I like that. I like that. What would you do if you weren't afraid? I like that. Coulter, you got anything to add? Um, not as philosophical, but more from a practical approach, I would say if if you are a bow hunter, you should be doing this. Um, yeah. Just because the, there is essentially 0% chance that you will not improve <laughs> on something. Yeah. Um, I've talked to many guys and, that are doing it, and they the biggest thing is it makes them shoot their bow a lot earlier in the year than they would otherwise. Mm -hmm. Their gear is tuned up, and then obviously the physical part, it's pushing people to – you know, whenever you sign up for a competition, whether it's just a trail run or a train to hunt event or something, the switch kind of goes off in your brain and says, okay, I got to, now I'm signed up, I've paid the dues, it's time to get rocking. 
and that's a pretty big motivator. And but people can just to get use Katie's approach if they like, but also if they just want to get better at being a more effective bow hunter, this is something that they should strongly consider. Different yeah. than just 3D shoot. And and then a lot along those same lines, the people that you meet, the group, the community is anything but intimidating and overwhelming. It's there's a lot of really cool things that happen at every event that are pretty inspirational and motivating and pro- probably the best part about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I would agree. I, I, one of the things that I wanted to back, kind of back up and touch on as well is that, that lady that Katie talked to in the, in the stands. I think that that's a huge testimony to have somebody – this, a little intimidated and shy, and she came there to find out, like, what are people really saying when they're, like, out of earshot of the competitors? Are they really, like, oh, I can't believe, like, are they talking bad about them? Are they kind of laughing at them? Because competitors, competitors are all, like, we've heard it a hundred times. Man, competitors, they're so supportive of each other, and, like, they help each other take uh, their packs off, and, like, there's a, this huge camaraderie around being a competitor at the event. But um, having this this lady, you know, basically testify that even in the crowd, like I, I was in the crowd, just kind of hanging back and seeing, you know, what was being said back here, and and to find out that she's saying, that, oh yeah, people like people are super supportive, even like when people aren't listening, like that's that's an important piece of the puzzle to, for people yeah. to under for people to understand that she was nothing but a spectator, she was just sitting back listening to what people are saying about. You know, are they bad mouthing their, comp- their husband's competition? Are they like, are none of that's happening? And I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge test- testimony to not only the competitors and who pe- the people that choose to do this, but the people who choose to come and just hang out and be part of it and just watch it. Everybody is so supportive and it has a lot to do with the amount of sacrifice and, um, and um, physical preparation and mental fortitude and grit that it takes to to not only do this competition but just to prepare for a competition like this. So um, it that's pretty cool that, uh, that that you got a chance to talk to her and she's she's sounds like she's ready to pull the trigger next year, huh? She's ready. She's like, that's awesome. I'm gonna that's I'm gonna awesome. compete next year for sure. She's like, I'll see you next year. She's like, all right. Awesome. <laughs> that's awesome and on that note you guys the last thing time I talked to you guys face to face it was well we might be moving to some place a lot cool like a lot more awesome than where any of you suckers live so what, what, what's on the horizon for you guys number one that's, uh, do you have any hunts for the fall that's all that's on the horizon right now you know? <laughs> that's it that's the only thing that's on the horizon is September is three weeks away and we're ready to hunt out I can't think of anything else at this point. Yeah. I, I, Katie, are you, are you as bad as Coulter? Or like, are you, do you have the elk hunting bug right now? I I have the bug, but not nearly as severely as Coulter. And Coulter yeah. talks about hunting and thinks about hunting 365 days a year. It's because, well, yeah, I'm the same way. But once, <laughs> as the rut gets closer, like I can, like my neck swells up. I'm just like that's crazy. <laughs> like my wife is like, get out of here. Like she starts, like, what are you doing? You're like losing your mind. I get it. I totally get it. I totally <laughs> get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why are you, why are you taking the bark off the trees? And we can't even answer. We don't even know why. Whereas I don't know what. What happened just now? Like, what am I doing? Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> we we'll are, yeah. We are going to be spending the first uh, two and a half weeks in Montana for the archery okay. season. Uh, my folks are going to come up and hunt the first week with us. Nice. And uh, we have a optimally timed wedding. A Ted on September 22nd, which is awesome. <laughs> Whoever that is does not like you. Is that your friend? It's got to be. It's got to be Katie's friend. <laughs> They're both. It is. It but, is. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. But, you know, more pressure is good. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, we'll finish. So we got two and a half weeks to start the season, and then 
we'll see what happens that first couple of weeks and then what needs to be done after that. Yeah, yeah. Katie's looking at maybe starting work in October in Oregon. Okay. So I'll I'll be hunting solo or doing whatever needs yeah. to be done for the freezer in October and um, I'm gonna go to Oregon and hunt, do a rifle elk hunt with my brother. He's got the tag. For elk. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think. And then, uh... yeah. So uh, the plan is right now, and as far as a moving target uh, with traveling work, but the plan is to potentially be in Bermuda from April to June, and that's why we were kind of like, we're not sure if we'd be able to fly back to the states for one of the regional qualifiers. Right. Um, but it's also a possibility. Um, yeah, never say never. A qualifier in the <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah right? <laughs> It'd be a good if you go to Bermuda, man. <laughs> there may not be a <laughs> water <after the> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, the nice thing, I, like I told you guys, the nice thing about being the national champ is you get an automatic bid in the next year's national championship. The, pro- the, the question really is, well, how much training are you going to be able to do in Bermuda, and how much beach sitting are you going to be doing? <laughs> well, sandbags would be easy to come by. <laughs> oh, you got that right, son. You can put you can, you'll be able to make the biggest, largest mini sandbags as you want with that yeah. with that much sand around, and you yeah. can get some swimming in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. We've got the no no excuses kind of an attitude, so we we, I like uh, it. we improvise. I like it. I like it. I, I have no doubt you guys will be ready for next year. So, you guys, thanks. Uh, you know what? Is, um, is there anything you guys you guys want to add? I mean, I, I want to make sure that we get everything in. I think that uh, we covered a ton as far as like your background and what you think about the you know the challenge and and the team competition and uh, anything else you guys want to add? No, it's been a great experience for us. It's been really awesome to do it together and then to be part of that community you know every year every event just meet more and more people that you know with social media now you can stay connected with some of these people when you drive through their towns and you just call them up and they're the kind of folks that you throw up a tent or they give you their couch and um maybe you only talk to them for you know, 15 or 20 minutes at the national event, but they're opening their homes to you. you know? so yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good group, which most of the honey community is, and that's it's a great group to be associated with. And it comes from the top down, I want, you know, so you're doing a great job. Yeah, we really appreciate what you're doing, and uh, we tell everybody um, about what we're doing with Train to Hunt, and just hoping to keep spreading the word. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all we can ask. I sure appreciate you guys. I was excited to see you guys this year. And, uh, I, uh, I just appreciate everything you guys represent and everything you do for Train to Hunt. And uh, we'll just keep on keeping on. Good luck this fall. Make sure that you um, share some pictures and some stories and that kind of stuff with us, too, as, as well as something that I'm trying to spread the word in the community is we kind of have this, like, everybody's, like, we have this race season where everybody kind of connects and, and catches up. And then once hunting season uh, hits, um, it's part of the byproduct of we don't have a bunch of egos out there that everybody kind of falls off the map and nobody knows, like, is anybody shooting anything out there? I would just encourage you guys to at least share it with our train hunt community page mm-hmm. so we can see how you guys are doing out there. So um, thanks again, you guys. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. and. Uh, Good luck this fall, and uh, stay in touch. All right. Same to you. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye.